Hi, my name is Fran Matera. I am the nurse educator for the Emergency and Trauma Services here at Children's Oakland. And today we're going to talk a little bit about disaster preparedness. Um, ironically, we're kind of living through a disaster or the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 right now. Um, but I did start preparing this in October, November of last year. So it's kind of fortuitous that we were thinking about doing this uh, this year for Skills Day. Okay, so our objectives today, we're gonna to describe various hospital surge models. Um, we're going to describe the hospital response to a mass casualty incident, be it internal or external. Describe the hospital incident command system or HICS, which you may have heard during town meetings, they refer, refer to the HICS uh, command system. We're gonna talk about uh, flow in the PICU uh, for uh, like a, a vertical evacuation or even a horizontal evacuation. We're going to talk about communication modalities in disaster because there are many internal and external modes of, of communication. We're going to define, define a mass casualty incident. And for the ED staff, we're going to talk about MCI triage. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about ESI versus MCI triage. And we're going to talk about um, identifying those MCI triage categories using Jumpstart and Start, which are the triage uh, modalities for, for MCI triage. Um, we would love to have the VICU listen in. Uh, I don't think that it's going to be a requirement for you, but it is very, very interesting. So, okay. Um, so hospital surge models. They, um, they kind of help the hospital uh, estimate the number of resources that the hospital is going to require during a certain MCI scenario. So during COVID, we uh, really kind of didn't know what to expect, although we were watching Europe, we were watching New York. Um, so we kind of realized that some of the things that we would come upon would be shortages of like PPE um, and possible, you know, just um, the, the rest of the, the hospitals in the area, other than like in central metropolitan areas were, we're seeing lower volumes. So uh, there are various um, things that happen because of a pandemic. Um, you can also have chemical, like our, um, our refineries. We have refineries in the area, so, so there can be releases of gas where the, the, uh, the county would request that people stay in place. We have conventional, such as explosive devices, the Twin Towers, the Oklahoma City bombing, um, uh, the Boston Marathon uh, bombing. We have foodborne, so like E. coli or listeria or, or a norovirus of some sort. Um, or we can have nuclear radiologic, which um, can be on a small scale, but on a very larger scale, if for some reason like a nuclear reactor or to, um, to malfunction. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about our pandemic, COVID-19. So the national, there was a response nationally uh, on the state level and on the county level. And as we well know, uh, in the Bay Area, we were uh, ordered to shelter in place very early. Now it's been about 10 weeks um, and we're starting to reopen a little bit, um, but very slowly. But initially it was essential services only. So uh, obviously the hospital can't shut down. Um, and also, you know, things that people rely on, uh, grocery stores, that kind of thing. But within the hospital, um, you know, a lot of people were furloughed or were working remotely. So the county also ensures that hospitals have adequate supplies and beds for anticipated surge. Uh, in 2009, the SARS uh, epidemic, H1N1, that kind of made the county realize that we don't have um, a plan if a certain population is is hit more than others, especially in pediatrics in 2009. So the county kind of helped to determine where these pediatric ped beds would be once our facility was full. Um, and uh, to the same token, we offered outside hospitals very recently within the last 10, 10 weeks to take their pediatric patients so they could, they could open up for more adult beds. Institution-wise, um, you can refer to Infection Control Manual Section 3.12, which is about the pandemic outbreak. This has been 
um, in place for many, many years. This was developed many, many years ago. So um, in the event of a pandemic or an external disaster or, or an internal disaster, even a code triage, the hospital incident command system is activated. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about the hospital incident command in a second. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Surgeries were limited to essential procedures only. And now we're getting to the point where we can add back some of the elective surgeries. All non-essential employees were either furloughed or now they work remotely. We had just-in-time training for frontline employees, and that includes classes like the PPE um, champions, but also like our NP swapping, which as we know, went back and forth. Is it OPNP? Is it NP? Is it just, you know, can you do RVPs, COVIDs together? So, you know, it's ongoing training day to day. Changes in policy to protect our healthcare uh, professionals and uh, our personnel and patients, such as our masking uh, requirement that everyone wear a mask inside the facility. Programs and policies regarding equipment and supplies. So, such as our PPE, making sure that we have adequate supply and if we run out on the unit level where we can get that from um, uh, elsewhere, from materials management. Okay, so we're gonna very briefly talk about hospital incident management team. So this is the type of command system that many, many facilities and many, many um, services use. Fire, police, I'm in search and rescue. This is exactly what they do. So you have an incident command. At the top of the incident command is the incident commander. Everyone will report to him or her. The people under that the commander are the public information officer who is the one that determines what information gets out, how that information is gonna get out to the media or to the community or even to patients or to staff. Uh, our liaison officer is the one that makes sure that we have all the resources that we need and if we have to go outside of our hospital to, um, to get those resources that they kind of coordinate that. The safety officer is the one that makes sure that everything that's done within the hospital keeps us and our patients and families safe. The medical technical specialists are obviously our physicians like in infection control, uh, in the ED, in the PICU, um, but also includes uh, EVS, hospitality, biomed, um, engineering, just to make sure that everything is functioning and that the resources that are needed on the front line are there and that they're done safely. Staff members that also report to the incident command are operations, planning, logistics, finance, um, administration, section chiefs. I'm not going to go into those. If you have, if you're interested in that, I would recommend going to the FEMA website and take courses ICS 100 and ICS 200, and that talks very specifically about all the roles and who does who does what. For us here in the hospital, the policies that we want you to review are the Emergency Operations Plan or EOP, Section 410, which is about crisis communication, how things are communicated within the hospital, how things are communicated from us to the county or from the county to us or from other facilities or um, like ambulance services. Also, I want you to review policy 16.3, which is patient flow policy, and that's basically how we determine how patients will move or um, what resources we need to, uh, to you know, expedite patient care. All right, how does communication with staff happen? So EOP plan for staff notification. In the ED, we have a, um, a disaster tree. So the person on top of each column would call the next person who would then in turn call the next person. So I'm assuming something like that also exists in the PICU. Uh, also cell phone notifications, we're all into texting now, so that would probably be the easiest way to notify everybody uh, kind of all at once. By phone or intranet or email, by HIS broadcast messages overhead. In, within the hospital, we might be given two-way radios briefings, and then we also have a disaster hotline that is put into place during these kinds of, uh, of incidents. How do we communicate with parents? So family would be notified overhead if they're in, in the hospital, uh, by hospital TV channel, 
We might post billboards, printed material from social services, or we might talk directly to the families or patients. There's also a program put out by the American Red Cross called, called the Safe and Well Program, where you go on and you register yourself, your family, and this is one way that people can uh, look and go to to see if you are safe and well or you can check to see if your relatives in a disaster area are well because systems you know phone systems may be down cell towers may be down so this is one way to um, to, to communicate indirectly with our families okay so for an internal disaster so the HICS or the hospital incident command system would be put into place immediately during the interim, if, uh, if this was sudden, nursing supervisor would act as the incident commander until the incident command system is set up. We would determine the level of evacuation. Would it be a horizontal evacuation or would it be a vertical evacuation? So with a horizontal evacuation, maybe we've had an infrastructure failure, a water leak or no oxygen or something like that. So we would have to move one unit to an, a different area of the hospital. And that's the easiest type of evacuation. A vertical evacuation is, it takes tremendous resources as the PICU is now realizing uh, with their impending move to the fourth floor. So it could be a vertical evacuation, could be loss of structural integrity, it could be infrastructure failure, could be a contamination in part of the building, or it could be a man-made or mother nature threat. Um, I will never forget in 1991, I was working, I was PICU, uh, bedside nurse and that was during the Oakland fire and uh, I just remember the charge nurse um, just frantically kind of fig trying to figure out how we were going to evacuate patients because there was a threat that we might have to evacuate if the fire got close enough to the hospital um, so that was really quite frightening um, and the, I remember the generators went or the um, electricity went out and that was the longest 20 seconds of my life because I was taking care of an unstable patient that was vented and my isolation room went completely black and that was the longest 10 to 15 seconds in my life okay so we're going to talk a little bit about pick you flow which would be a vertical evacuation. We're gonna talk, talk about their plan, which is the train, and we'll talk about what that means. Code triage roles, your code triage alert checklist. All right, our train matrix. Train stands for triage by resource allocation for inpatients. And it was developed by a hospital in Chicago. Um, so we're kind of piggybacking on them. Um, but it's, it's pre-planning. It's a tool for pre-planning how an evacuation would happen, a vertical evacuation would happen. It categorizes according to resource transportation needs, life support, mobility, nutrition, pharmacy needs. So you can go from the blue, which is somebody that probably you don't have in the PICU. So they would be somebody that could probably just be carried out or uh, in a wheelchair up to specialize where you have maximum support. You have an intubated child, they're immobile, there are multiple drips, um, they're not even being fed. So that would take tremendous resources to evacuate that patient. Um, but it does help to determine what types of resources will be needed to evacuate. So the train color determination is part of shift to shift report. So every shift you go into uh, EPIC and you determine what color your patient is. And that's a good um, way for the charge nurse and the attending to know what types of patients are in the department and what would be required. Um, and you evacuate according to the number of resources required. If it were a vertical uh, evacuation, most likely you would evacuate the, the easiest first from, and then the most difficult or the red column uh, at the end. Okay, so your code triage roles, you have the bedside nurse who reports to the team captain who then again uh, reports to the team leader. The team leader, the respiratory therapist, and the ward clerk all report to the charge nurse. The PICU attending and the charge nurse work together in collaboration to figure out the best way to, to evacuate the unit. And then you have the PICU attending and or the charge nurse would uh, report to the incident command who would then uh, let them know uh, what, what and how to proceed. 
Okay, so the PICU code triage alert staff checklist. Every uh, role, the bedside nurse team, captain, team leader, charge nurse, PICU attending, all have a checklist that they are given. So you have three phases. You have phase one, which is communication. I kind of talk, I kind of think of that as the pre-preparation for each role. This is where you're making sure your patient has patient labels and that they have their armband on um, and that you're kind of figuring out how this is going to, going to, ha to, to happen. Phase two is to gather your equipment. So this is where you're preparing for evacuation by gathering all the necessary supplies. And then phase three is to evacuate. Okay, so we already kind of talked about the chain of command from bedside nurse to pick you attending. Um, the one thing I left out there was the incident commander who the PICU attending would be reporting to and that the incident commander would be also reporting to the PICU attending to let them know uh, their expectations. All right, so now we're just going to talk about the code triage for the bed, bedside nurse. So phase one, communicate. You want to verify that the patient has their ID labels and their ID allergy bands on and the labels will be printed out by your ward clerk. You want to make sure that you have your pillowcase and you label it with your patient name, your, their MRN number, and your name, and the train designation placed on the pillowcase. So in, in the drawers or in the pillowcase, you would have uh, colored tape. So you would attach that to your pillowcase. So you would have green tape. On that green tape, you might write with a Sharpie, the patient's name, the MRN number, and your name. The next phase would be gather. So at this point, you're gathering a chart that's being done by your ward clerk, that's being copied by your ward clerk. You're getting flashlights and headlamps, all the equipment that you're gonna need that the team captain and the team leader are gathering from the closets in the, um, in the, the PICU. You wanna gather meds and supplies to administer to make sure that you have the supplies that are needed to give the medications, syringes, et cetera. You want to make sure you have 24 hours worth of formula for our babies or breast milk bottles and nipples. Make sure your patient has a gown and you have a supply of diapers. You also want to make sure that your patient has uh, the, the train designation, the color on them. So maybe on their little beanie um, or on their gown. Um, try not to put it obviously on the skin, but uh, that, that piece of tape should be on your patient as well. And then phase three is evacuation. You want to follow your color-coded train instructions. Evacuation, evacuate as ordered by the charge nurse. You want to place the patient in a med sled or the evacu chair if uh, it's appropriate as needed or as directed to do so. And these, these backpacks here are just uh, those backpacks that are in each of the rooms. So these, this is the supplies for an evacuation. Okay, so internal disaster requiring evacuation. You would have your med sled and your striker evacuation chair. Uh, as part of this, we're going to have you look at videos as to how to use these two. And then when you come in for skills day, we will be going, actually, uh, you will be doing evacuation down, downstairs with each of these modalities. So I'm not going to belabor. Okay, evacuation tracking. This is what the PICU would be using to track their patients where they are. Um, and it has all the information that's needed uh, down to the mode of transport and the hospital where they're going to. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about mass casualty incident. What is a mass casualty incident? Well, an incident that produces multiple casualties such as that emergency services, medical personnel, and referral systems within the normal catchment area cannot provide adequate and timely response and care without unacceptable morbidity and or mor mortality. So in other words, we're gonna be doing the most, um, the most good for the most number of patients because our demand is gonna outpace our resources, okay? All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about ReadyNet, which is down in the ED. We have a computer that's dedicated for ReadyNet and also half the screen is ReadyNet, half the screen is a video of the um, helipad so that we can visualize it in real time. So we would be, we would get notification from ReadyNet about the type of incident where the incident occurred and request for available capacity to receive emergent, urgent, and non-urgent patients. So at CHO, our standard is 246, so we can take two emergent or critical 
four urgent or non, non-critical and six non-urgent. Now, that being said, we recently had three full traumas come in. Well, that exceeds our resources. And it did re- exceed our resources. And thankfully, we had PICU attendings. We had surgical attendings. We had um, the PICU nurses come down to help us out. And it went quite smoothly considering how chaotic it was. Um, so we really appreciate the, the um, willingness for, for our PICU colleagues to come down and help us out. Okay, what are the three types of alerts? So we have an advisory, so maybe they're on their way to the scene that we've heard that there's a multi-casualty incident or a multi-car uh, crash. Um, it advises us of a potential incident, uh, that there will be potential uh, injuries, patients to be transported. Then comes the alert, the response is likely, there's a heightened level of readiness, and then there's activation. So a response is going to be required. Okay, and this is when the uh, ambulance services in Alco and Alameda County uh, is letting us know where these patients are going to be going. Okay, at time zero between the call and the arrival of our patients, you want to set up the hospital incident command. If it is a large uh, disaster such as this pandemic or a bombing or, you know, something, a massive uh, chemical release. Um, so the nursing sur- supervisor would be your interim incident commander until the team arrives. Patient care areas, if it were a major disaster, we would be making room in the hospital by discharging patients that were probably earmarked to be discharged pretty soon. We would set up a triage area, our ED rooms, and our inpatient areas would be set up for um, resuscitations and, and patient care. Uh, we would also be discharging patients from the ED who were non-urgent that could wait uh, several days to be cared for. Um, we want to assign roles and we would call in extra staff if only if directed to do so by the ED and PICU management and or the incident command. So I want to stress here that we use the current system until directed to do otherwise by the ED management or incident command. So in other words, we triage by severity just as we always do using the ESI or emergency severity index, our one to five. We would treat the most severe first and then we would move on. Patient tracking. So this is how we would uh, track patients if for some reason a a large number of patients arrive by foot or by car, uh, we might have to set up the disaster disaster triage um, tracking system. So this is where we would put their their tag number, their name, their MRN number, and all the information to keep track of where this patient is. So the PICU role during an MCI. Uh, Your response is indicated upon request by the ED attending, surgical attending, nursing supervisor, or incident command. So our PICU, our wonderful PICU attendings came down. They are team leads uh, along with the ED attendings um, and the surgical attendings. The PICU nurse, again, much appreciated, would report to the charge nurse who will direct where they uh, would be most useful. Most of the time we uh, utilize you guys as bedside nurses and med nurses because you don't know where our supplies are. So um, that's an unfair role for you to play. I wanted to point out this uh, picture with all the tags on it, the name or well, the role uh, badges. So everyone that's in that room needs to have a badge on. If they do not have a badge, they should not be in the room. We also record all full traumas for educational purposes, um, but uh, just to help us to determine what we did well and what maybe we need to, to, to work on. So again, I wanna thank all uh, PICU staff for their support. Okay, so surge during a pandemic, so an extended response. So HICS is initiated immediately. Um, all, all different departments come together to um, make sure that we have adequate resources, that we have enough staff. We, um, we diverted staff that were furloughed, like our um, 
our surgical nurses were, became um, like, they became our screening nurses, some of them, or they did blood draws, that kind of thing. So the hospital went to essential services own, only. Um, and uh, we had a, an alternative, well, actually we still have the alternative, uh, the alternate unit, the on-site on alternate unit, which is a tent that's set up under the garage which is over in the emergency parking area. That's still up. Uh, a lot of hospitals are, are now taking that down, but uh, ours is still open. Um, and it, it has not been used yet, but it can be negative pressure, it can be positive pressure, so um, it can be used for anything. We were thinking maybe it would be used for the infusion center um, or for injured or maybe our COVID unit. So we would do just-in-time training, like I talked about the PPE training, ongoing reassessment with transparency, our, our town hall meetings that have uh, kept us informed as to where we are in this pandemic. So when, it is o when is it over? In New York, they're still going. So plan for a marathon. Um, we have to minimize uh, personnel exhaustion you know, by providing food, which our community has so um, willingly done. It's just been wonderful. Uh, we want to communicate, make sure that fan, that staff can communicate with their families, have, take breaks, that kind of thing. We haven't uh, had an issue with this um, because our volumes are, are significantly down. We want to anticipate waves. So with COVID even, we're anticipating that in the fall or winter, we're going to be getting a second wave. So we can anticipate that we're going to go through the surge again. Um, uh, and we have to prepare for that. When do we stand down? When uh, the Hicks system determines that the pandemic is, uh, that, that, that the surge uh, protocols are no longer needed. And we've been performing after action reviews all through this, um, but after the epidemic is kind of over and we would come together and, and figure out what we did well and maybe what what kinds of things need to be worked on to make this uh, a better situation or a better um, process. We do, uh, we, if for some reason we need to decontaminate, we have a decontamination shower in the emergency room if it's just for a couple of patients. Uh, we had pepper spray kids, um, you know, we have kids that come in with just, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, an exposure to a chemical that we can just put in the, the portable shower pan, which collects all the contaminated water and then disposed of by engineering. So we would call engineering to get rid of the water. We also have decontamination tents that are in the big sheds in the back, in the back lot for large scale, de scale decontaminations. Our LVNs in the ED and some of the hospitality personnel are trained to don and doff these suits and to take patients into these decontamination tents and get them washed down uh, from the hot area where they're, uh, they are before going through the shower, the warm area, which would be your shower, and then the cold area after they've been hosed down um, and getting dressed. So the RN and MD's roles are no different than they are now. There's no active uh, role in decontamination process. Post-decontamination care is by level of ESI acuity, okay? So our disaster container are, it is in our equipment room. So the container uh, has plastic bags for contaminated items and clothing, triage tags, patient logboard, flags for disaster triage. And we're going to talk about the different colors and what they mean. We also have the decontamination shower and pan, and which you can see down in the right lower area. It's set up in the shower that's just inside the ambulance bay. And that's the pan and the hose that hooks up here on the left-hand side. And you would just hose them down, it collects the water, you would call engineering, they would dispose of the water. So what can you do? You can go on the FEMA website, you can take ICS 100 and 200, which goes through the incident command, uh, what all the roles are and who responds to whom, that kind of thing. You can go on American Red Cross. Uh, to the safe and well registration to make sure that your family um, is registered so that others outside of the area, if you have relatives or friends, can see that you are safe. DisasterTriageGame.org, that's um, after we go through disaster triaging, that's kind of a game that you can do. They give you different scenarios and you determine what level of triage acuity they are. 
training.fema.gov is another good resource for information, stop the bleed, drills and simulations, and preparing your family and home for unanticipated disasters. So I just want to take uh, this opportunity to thank everyone, thank everyone for all you do. Um, we have really come together, and we're uh, you are have been incredibly professional, um, and we just appreciate everything you do. So thank you.